we here to discuss uh, diversity and inclusion and interestingly we have more women on the panel than men so with your permission ladies uh, can i direct the first question to the minority here oh my god <laughs> okay amit uh, tell me uh, do you think advertising today is still all about the mad men certainly not <laughs> it's neither mad nor is it dominated by men anymore uh, and the good part is it's not dominated by men anymore which is which is fantastic it's not mad it's it's that's that's disheartening it should be a little madder though uh, i feel we've moved a, a lot away from just the men tag uh, i think we've we've moved into a, a more diverse and a more inclusive uh, way of working and possibly if i may say so a more beautiful way of working uh, i i think it's it's rip advertising represents the society and and that's what our world is is about so in a in in a short form no it's not mad men anymore for sure harshil uh, you know you started an agency when you were just out of college and in the past 14 years 14 years it's been uh, how have you seen uh, the evolution of diversity uh, you know in in the industry in your agency are you seeing more women in the leadership positions today than earlier yeah definitely first first i just want to uh, thank sam for a wonderful address it was so decisive and so clear and really lays the framework so thank you for that um i think you know as at shebang right now we have 51% of women in leadership 49% of men in leadership with three guys who run the company but it's uh, you know i mean i don't think we can blame ourselves for that um and uh, we are about 60% women in the workforce 40% men in the workforce uh i think in addition to what sam said as the opportunity with uh, 30 lakh clients 3 million clients i think the other opportunity for india is the india to the world opportunity uh which is you know an example interesting example of infosys and infosys what infosys has done for it is what marketing and technology transformation uh you know so the softer side of it as i like to call it is what is our global opportunity So I think as an Indian uh, set of leaders we need to start getting good at that being able to you know I think the diversity challenge for us is less men versus women it's how do we work with other cultures our culture is more tuned to working with other cultures so I think how can we better utilize that and I think also maybe 8 to 9 years down the line we will be having a totally different conversation because by 2050 Africa is going to be 40% of the world's population so the Indian leaders today who are good at working with the world are the ones who are going to rule the roost in brazil and africa as service markets and you know then be able to cater to markets across the world so i think that's the india opportunity on diversity and inclusion and you know of course i don't want to therefore bypass what we need to do in our own country but i think that's the larger opportunity for us so uh, from my understanding i think representation part is definitely being taken care of slowly uh, the second aspect is discrimination Um, I was speaking to Susan Credle. Uh, she is the global CCO of uh, FCB, and she mentioned that uh, whenever she attended industry events, she almost felt invisible because men willingly ignored her. So I want to come to each uh, of the women leaders on this panel and try and understand. Uh, you know, have you faced any subtle discrimination in the industry? Uh, something which is not bad enough to report, but demeaning enough to you know not let go lying down. Uh, can we start with you? I know you're looking at me in my eye and asking. <laughs> um, of course, it exists. It exists at home. It exists in office. It had exists in when you travel in bus, train, aeroplane. I mean, I've got men walking up to me, and I've posted in Facebook saying, "Can you give me your aisle seat? You don't need so much leg space, dude. Book it, right?" Uh, so those kind of, I mean, that's a travel experience, right? So all I'm saying is, it exists. Um, but was i ignored and i felt blinded no never because at least in the uh, i started in media i've never done the creative side of the business we had roda mehta ketki gupte we had enough stalwarts of women i worked with divya karani divya radha krishnan um there is anupriya in publicis heading it now uh, there is a whole lot of us sitting here and lot more who are sitting uh, who's going to join you later sonali malviya moshmi kar name it we have enough in the industry have we all faced a discrimination and me and rati keep chatting about it in the past also uh of course we do it exists 
it'll continue to exist. What is important is this unconscious bias or conscious bias. We need to voice it out and table it and leave it for it to solve for. The challenge occurs is when we are trying to put it under the carpet, which happens 90% of the time. So it's upon people like us, educated and in the leadership position, immaterial of the gender, to talk about it openly and not put it under the carpets today. Lara, do you agree? Um, no, from my experience, especially in the work environment, I've never faced any discrimination uh, whatsoever. Uh, outside of work, yeah, maybe it does exist, but I would urge everyone or the few women over here, if you ever feel discriminated against, today there are enough policies and structures in place, so please go out and report it. Only if you report it can some action be uh, uh, taken. So, you know, don't think anything is either too small to be brushed under the carpet. If you felt something, there are systems and infrastructure in place to uh, report such things. So take full advantage of that. But no, I have not faced any discrimination, at least at uh, work. Rati. <laughs> okay. um, so I think I want to start off by saying that, uh, you know, being really very lucky to have a family, you know, who has been a great support and um, more importantly has given you know, allowed me to voice my opinions, allow me to come forward and make my own decisions. I think that's very, very important to start with. Um, and the next thing is that I'm also grateful for all the people, I mean, it's not just about women, right? Even men who have been great mentors and colleagues. I think you've been lucky in that front as well. Um, and just going back to the thing about discrimination, I think uh, to a certain extent, uh, experience has helped me to recognize uh, organizations that kind of mirror your values and give you that support and give you, uh, you know, that access to growth, right? Recognize your capabilities. And I've been able to, I think, recognize that and capitalize on that and make those changes as and when I thought was necessary, right? Uh, so to a certain extent, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag, not necessarily have faced so much of discrimination. Uh, but I do know it exists. and. Um, I would echo what Preeti and Lara mentioned that don't leave it in the bag, you know, confront it. Uh, come forward and talk about it. At the end of the day, it's about being true to yourself, right? And I think all of the women over here, to a certain extent, have gone through the journey about being true to yourself, and we are here because of that. And I think that would be one big advice and echoing what both of them said, right? Just go out there and, you know, embrace it and grab whatever you think is your right. I want to ask you something slightly different. Uh, I think that one differentiation when it comes to your work life is I think the maternity break. And I've still seen men refer to it as a holiday as opposed to something that's absolutely essential in that life cycle of a woman. So have you kind of encountered something to that effect where, you know, uh, I mean, I'll leave it to you to answer. So um, let me start first with my own experience. So you know, I, I had uh, children a little late, okay, and uh, uh, and I didn't have initially much support, just me and my husband. And for the first one and a half months, you know, every day I used to think, okay, do I want to continue in this work because can I really do everything together? And uh, uh, then after about a month and a half, uh, I realized that yes, it, it is something that you can do together, but you need to uh, co-opt a lot of people into your journey. And sometimes, you know, for men also, it is about sensitizing them. You know, till they don't have a small child in the house, they don't really realize the kind of work which it needs. They don't realize what is the effort which has to go in. And, and through this journey, I figured that it is about sensitizing people because we are a very people-intensive business. You know, it's, it's a place where you have to get all of yourself. And unless we realize the problems that other people face, uh, by bringing them up, by telling them, by sharing with them, they are quite often don't appreciate what the other person is going through. 
And uh, what I've seen over years now is that now people are even comfortable talking about paternity leave. In fact, just about two days back, I got a mail from one of my colleagues saying that, you know, guess what, I'm here only for the next one week because then I'm going on a six-week paternity leave. And it was quite okay. Everybody was like, yeah, fine, he deserves this. So nobody asked the question. So I think we've come a long way, but uh, I think somewhere I would echo what the other lady said, that this, this whole discrimination is so ingrained in different levels of society that it needs all of us to be vigilant, that you know, whenever it comes out, we must call it out. We must share with other people that, listen, there is a bias here. You know, let's, let's review what we are talking about and, and change. And there's another aspect, uh, I mean, more from an industry and work point of view. Now, you, we call advertising as an industry which kind of changes perceptions, mindsets. And still, uh, we see ads which say, "Meri girlfriend chalti hai 500 rupee per kilometer," but "Ola micro chalti hai 5 rupee per kilometer." And even worse, the recent layer shot ad, which kind of made tried to make rape sound funny, which obviously it wasn't. So, do you think that an equal, I mean, having enough women or basically diversity in the team which was creating this ad or many other ads for that matter? will make, about, make a difference and the ads will come out cleaner, better, more progressive? <laughs> it hasn't it been? I mean, I think these are, of course, very bad examples of what happened, but they're equally good examples of so many so-called women categories, like washing machines or washing powders to whatnot, where the father is doing, the mother is traveling or vice versa. It reflects the trend, right? It reflects the change in the mindset. It is sometimes in the initial days when those ads came, it was like force fitting this narrative. But today in 2022, it isn't because pandemic changed things on how households are managed and how women deal with work and how even men deal with work, right? Uh, so I think it's a welcome shift and uh, there's more to come. But to me, the fact that we are counting headcounts and, uh, you know, your agency, mein kitte women, mere agency, you know, I mean, that is to me, uh, that conversation should stop. I think we have crossed that bridge to a large extent. We need to be keeping an open eye and not be blindsided, definitely. But we need to now move, move beyond the human welfare and mental welfare. And I think that's where we are traveling to. So ads are one representation of the society, definitely. I just want to add in here, you know, I think laying what was set as the foundation at the start I think it's not just about having more women in the room. Because I think there are more women in the room. You know, if I take the example, 60% women, 40% men. So I don't think it's that. I think that as an industry, if we need to add more value to our customers and our clients, I mean, to our clients and their customers, we need to be in sync with consumers. And as an industry, we've forgotten how to do that. You know, we do not go and, you know, for us, it is this one geography of this city that we live in, which is a representation of our writers and you know, for our creators, that's where it comes from, or it may be other geographies, but we are not in touch with the consumer of this country as much as we need to. And I think that's where diversity will come in. If we listen with empathy and we really understand, that's what's needed. I don't think it's more you know, different genders in the room. I completely agree. I think it's all about uh, sensibilities. It's all about, you know, you know, having the knowledge and the understanding of the consumer rather than do you have equal representation. It's the mindset change, I think, that is what is re needed. I think also, unfortunately, today in India, everyone has become so sensitive and so intolerant that you can just offend anyone and everyone, right? So I think just having a diverse uh, team is not really going to... Uh, uh, help. So I, I I agree. I, I think I think it's it's we need to be open to hearing more voices. We need to be exploring a lot more. Uh, whether it's small town, whether it's people with other kind of challenges, whether it's physical challenges or mental challenges. You know, some of these still remain a bit taboo. So how do you bring all of these things a little more into the open? Because then you can converse. Then you can you know find solutions. Representation is not a problem. We are seeing enough women, yes. But you know, we also see cases like Me Too. I mean, it happened four years ago. And at that point in time, we saw a bunch of, uh, you know, very, um, uh, you know, great leaders from the industry who came up uh, and formed the collective, which was basically to fight against the boys club, as they call it in the advertising world. So do you think four years later, much has changed? 
I mean, do women have enough voice to actually speak out against the boys club within the industry? Where's the boys club? I don't know. I think like I said today, every organization by law has to have so many, you know, boards and all that in place that there are, I think also now men are a lot more conscious and aware and they are careful before they open their mouths. So that's also... Uh, I, haven't spoken, I haven't spoken since the time for the first question. But I, 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 you know, in some way or form, it started the movement, but I think what organizations have done post that is to m create an environment where people are not too afraid to speak up, even if it's against some higher ups. Uh, I think uh, it is not just about, uh, so we're creating an atmosphere, it is also trainings, trainings of not just the people, also managers. I think a lot is happening there where sensitization is, is happening. Uh, and, and I feel, uh, that is the reason why it is much more safer and much more open now compared to, say, four years back. And yes, because of the sensitization, men are a lot more careful. And it was a much needed cleanse, actually. So again, tying back to if India has to be the service market of the world, serving the world, we can't afford to have these standards. So it was a much needed cleanse. Uh, I think across organizations, in our own organization, there was a particular complaint against a head of business looking after a particular city office. We didn't talk about it in the press. It was a head of business in the city office. Overnight, there was a survey sent out to all the women in that, in that particular office. The consideration of all those women was considered. There was, it was a majority who had uh, kind of uh, you know, said that, look, there has been some kind of an issue with respect to communication. Uh, not that there has been any... Uh, I mean, not that, you know, bad communication also should not be tolerated. So there was no, there was no inquiry or panel or anything of that sort also straight. Tomorrow, you're not coming to work from tomorrow. Because we cannot tolerate that in our workplaces. If we want to be, you know, as, as an industry, if we want to be an industry that wants to serve the world and then lead the world, we cannot tolerate this. It, it can't even be a conversation. That doesn't mean E4M should not talk about it. Please continue to talk about it. Let it be an industry voice. But, you know, let's, uh, it, it's not even something that we should be, uh, counting as a second nature. You know, now I'd like to come to the client side. Uh, there was another example, interesting again, of FCB, um, you know, which ended a hundred year old relationship with Nivea, allegedly because the client made homophobic comments. I want to understand how many agencies in India today have built their diversity plank strong enough to actually sever ties or take a step this drastic. Uh, are we ready to do something like that? Uh, Lara? <laughs> I think uh, the honest answer is uh, we can't afford to do that, right? Okay. But having said that, we've not, we've never in all these years have come across such a situation that it's, you know, come to a break point. Okay. Amit, what is it like at Densu? So, <coughs> see, the, the, the reality is that, uh, of course, when we, we, we are talking about various things, we are changing in, in many ways. Are we there? Certainly not there. We're taking baby steps and, and evolving and, and changing there. Uh, you, you have to take a stand on, on certain things. Uh, we are taking stand on a, on a lot of things. Of course, sometimes it is a tricky situation. We learn on the go. So yeah, I, I, I hope the situation doesn't arise, but, but yeah, I, I think as we move along, we are working things around and, and taking the right decisions, but baby steps, as I said. Um, so I think talking about the particular example you raised, see, um, I think in our country, some of these issues are not even known. I mean, quite often you don't even know uh, what really is the sexual bias, let's say, of, of people. You, you, it's not something that is openly discussed. Yes, maybe in a small group, but otherwise not really known. So to even discriminate or to talk about it openly is a question mark. Uh, just recently, we have started a survey wherein, you know, you check for some of these things to understand whether people are comfortable being their true selves in office. Are they able to engage with people? Do they feel that this is something that they can talk about? And what we have found is that even today, there is a lot of hesitance in terms of talking about certain issues. 
not because somebody is discriminating, but because you're just not comfortable in society at large. So I think it is, uh, it is good to open conversations, but we are still far ahead, uh, you know, away from a lot of these things. I don't think we are there yet. So uh, I just want to add that WPP has an initiative called Unite, which I'm part of. It's amazing to see how people open up about their gender preferences and talk about their challenges. And there is various, various work streams that we are part of. I'm part of one small one because for me, the idea of getting associated is because the operation that I run is a thousand member team. I will have that diversity. I need to accept it. I have an eight year old at home who sometimes questions, what am I? I'm born as a boy. Am I going to be straight or uh, am I going to be what in future? That's the awareness level an eight year old has today. So I'm part of Unite to learn. Uh, as leaders in the industry, what Unite kind of platform allows is for them to express or any employee to express their diversity challenges and come together. As far as the client question, it's a little tricky. I mean, we haven't faced any as yet, um, what uh, FCB faced through, uh, but uh, we'll cross the bridge when we come to it. Actually, I'd like to ask each of you, what are the kind of, uh, do you have such teams within your organization which kind of deals with this? Uh, Lara, can we start with you? Sorry, with me? Yeah. Uh, no, so we don't have separate teams uh, uh, for this, but if anything were to come up, we would provide senior level attention to it and get the problem uh, uh, solved. We also have a fairly open uh, system where uh, many people uh, come up to the HR team and voice their concerns and they've been very, uh, what can I say, generous or outgoing with their uh, uh, concerns. So in that sense, uh, yes, but there's no separate team. Yeah, so, so, so there are committees uh, which are set up uh, and they're set up zone-wise. So, so there is a Delhi committee, there is a Bangalore and a Bombay committee specifically for a reason because sometimes people want to talk face-to-face. -face. So, and, and this is represented by a lot of women and men, of course, at a senior level. And most times, if there is someone involved who is in any way also attached to this particular person. For example, there's someone in, in my team who there is a complaint against. I'm kept out of it. I don't even know what's happening around there till, till it reaches the decision level. Uh, so I think these things have been taken very, very seriously. And, and these committees are formed. Uh, there is an external person also there, uh, which is in case uh, there is a bias that comes in. There is a person who can lead you to to the right conclusion. So, so these are these committees formed there, uh, and and yeah, I think that just shows the seriousness of it, and people talk about it, and and I guess more comfort is created. That's interesting because I remember in 2016 we there was a lawsuit filed against the CEO of JWT, uh, Martino Gustavus, if, if I'm pronouncing it right. And uh, for uh, perpetuating uh, gender and race discrimination, you're talking about the topmost official doing that. Definitely a problem. Dati, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, um, at the publicist group, I mean, this is now completely become mainstream. Uh, for us, uh, we look at it on uh, three different pillars. It's not just about diversity. Uh, it's about inclusion and belonging as well. Right. Uh, we were talking about it uh, earlier in the lounge that for us at the group, uh, I mean, having um, Anupriya at the helm, um, for us, I mean, apart from that, I can give you so many stats, right? 50% uh, of my Starcom leadership are women. Um, um, three out of four regional leaders are women. So for us, I think diversity is we are there. I mean, we're doing a lot in that space. We are there. And for us, it's more about, uh, you know, um, it's capability rather than, you know, do you playing the gender card, right? You've reached this position because of your merit, and I can vouch for all of us over here, the women in this place. It's not just about the gender card. It's about, uh, you know, reaching this level of position because of your merit and your capabilities. So similarly, uh, apart from diversity, uh, which we, you know, run through our uh, Vivala program, we also have something called Pride, which focuses on LBGTQI, right? Uh, and we have Enable for Differently Abled. Uh, so from a group perspective, there's so much happening in all these three uh, pillars. And um, 
for us, I think, like I said, diversity is part and parcel. It's now the focus is shifting to kind of getting, uh, you know, pride in place in India. Uh, uh, how do we move beyond, uh, you know, just recognizing it, but also being sensitive and, you know, building a safe environment. Um, have we achieved scale? No. Have we started work on it? Yes. We have workshops, we have classes, we have uh, allied groups, you know, uh, to sensitize people, etc. So I think the group is doing a lot in the space and I think um, I'm quite excited because it's just a start and there's, you know, a lot more to do and take off. Harshan? Yeah, at Shebang, we have uh, three ways we look at it. One is we have, for the women, we have the Internal Complaints Committee, and that's a strong uh, strong function that runs itself. There's independent external people as well as internal people involved. Uh, so that's one strong part. We've also got Shebang for Good. Uh, so Shebang for Good has two parts. Uh, one is with respect to diversity and inclusion. We look at one part of diversity and inclusion from the point of view of uh, LGBTIQ. Uh, so there's enough people from the community that we've employed. So our workforce is about over 1,000 of us uh, between the five cities that we work in, three in India and two outside India. So uh, there's this fair amount of representation within the workforce uh, of the LGBTIQ community, and they run sensitization workshops. So uh, we had... Uh, so we prefer for people from the community to run sensitization workshops. We've recently got a recommendation that you need to have a separate third bathroom, which we're now kind of uh, looking into as well. And I think from an India perspective, you also got to look at diversity and inclusion from an economic standpoint. Because I think, uh, you know, most of us living here and sitting in this room, and I can make the judgment on behalf of all of us, I think we come from a space of relative privilege with respect to the rest of the country. So I think, you know, and, and, you know, our industry, I don't think we employ, I, our industry at the moment employs roughly, give or take, about 400,000 people. If you take just the IT majors combined, that's 3x of us. So as an industry, we have a lot to do in terms of bringing people into the workforce, and that is going to be through people, let's face it, it's going to be through people who, are, who do not have as much uh, socioeconomic exposure as us. So, so another part of our Shebang for Good team works with uh, close to 5,000 kids across schools uh, where we work on uh, uh, technical literacy, uh, specific with respect to coding and creativity, and we bring kids into the workforce. That's the agenda that we're working on. So um, right now it's 5,000, but, you know, I mean, I've taken a pledge that for the next 10 years it's going to be 10x of the number of people we employ. So I have to ramp up by September next year it needs to be 10,000 and then you know as fast as we grow we will do 10x of the number of people we work with so so we've got to bring more kids into uh, in, into the workforce and uh, especially from diverse backgrounds that are socio-economically diverse and then some of the stuff that we keep at the top with respect to respecting women treating them as equals uh, respecting all different uh, you know kind of uh, sexualities and genders etc respecting them as equals I think then that kind of comes into play. So um, at IBG, we do have, uh, uh, you know, a global initiative plus the local arms which support uh, both people from different genders as well as women specifically. Uh, but I think what we found apart from the committees which help is uh, that somewhere it's not about a one brush for everyone. So uh, uh, quite often in a lot of cases, it has to be sensitively heard while you may be telling people that these are the rules or these are the norms and this is what we would like. But uh, quite often when we get into a problem or a situation where somebody feels marginalized or somebody is feeling that, you know, this is not how I would like to be seen, then uh, we have to create more sensitive and special codes. And what we found is usually it's, it's about being flexible rather than uh, one norm which fits everyone and a case to case solution. So that's how we are uh, right now dealing with it. But I think we still have quite a few steps to take in terms of, uh, I think, the economic part which uh, Ashil spoke about, because that's quite an important piece now that, you know, you want more people to come into the workforce. And you're seeing a lot of younger people who are coming in are from outside major metros with very different kind of backgrounds. So how do you integrate them without feeling lost, without feeling, you know, not being a part of the group? kind of a thing. So those are other initiatives that we, we've taken on wherein you have a mentor program and, and you have a buddy who sort of helps you get into things and so on. So my next question is actually something that Harshal kind of touched upon beautifully. 
uh, you know, we've seen so many interesting ads talking about transgenders and how we should uh, give them equal opportunities. Uh, we had the Cannes Award winning PNG uh, transgender moms, then we had the Bhima advertisement. Uh, but when it comes to within, are we employing enough? I mean, are we at all looking into that aspect of, in, of employing people from that community in, within our office spaces? Um, Preeti? So, I don't think you recruit with that label, but it, you accept people as they are. I don't think today uh, there's a hue and cry about it as much, is what I see at least in the WPP and Gruber ecosystem. Are people open about their gender preferences and all? I don't think so as much. But programs like Unite, I'm sure each group is doing their own stuff, will allow people to express more in the coming years. But I don't think it's a recruitment strategy like how we need to get more women. It's not a recruitment strategy. Yeah, so I think I echo what Preeti uh, said. We've not actually, I think, received an application ever for, uh, from such a community. But, and if we were to receive, I think we would evaluate it based on whether that person is able to do the job or uh, not do the job and how they can fit into our uh, uh, work uh, environment. And another a small, before we wrap up, I think uh, another aspect is I think getting differently able people, giving them an opportunity to come on board. And I think pandemic has beautifully kind of aided that. So are we seeing many, uh, like Amit says, are we seeing a good percentage of uh, people uh, from the differently, uh, who are differently able in the uh, advertising industry today? Are we giving them enough opportunity to work with flexible hours or whatever they need? I don't think so, but you've given us something good to think about. It's a good, good note to end on because you've given us something and you provoked us with something to think about. No, so I was just going to say we do have some people already with us who are differently able, but I think we need to scale up because they may need different facilities, they may need uh, some more facilitation in terms of flexibility and, and maybe even technology. So there are some more steps that we need to take, but yes, we do currently also have people who are differently abled and who are working, I think, superbly well with us. Also, let me add, so we're doing a little bit of it, but a little bit of it. Uh, and uh, the, this, I think the discrimination while recruiting is far, far lower. What we need is for these guys to come up and, and we need to create those opportunities of these guys coming up and wanting to be a part of it. That we haven't done enough of. Uh, I think we've, we've shed the inhibition of, you know, discriminating because of some disability, but, but I guess we haven't done enough of getting them to, to come up. So I think we are out of time. Anybody wants to add something or we can conclude? Superb. So I think we should uh, uh, practice diversity uh, because it's not just because it's the right thing to do, also because it gives us a access to a larger talent pool and an opportunity to do so much, so much more. So I think on that note, I'll conclude. And thank you so much for being such amazing panelists. Thank you for joining us here.